So what I wanted to do um, just for the uh, first hour is um, to kind of set the stage, if you will, and uh, provide uh, kind of an overview of some of the broad trends that we're seeing in conflict, uh, try to put what we're seeing in some context, you know, where this, you know, what are we seeing today and how does it relate to how conflict has evolved um, on the continent um, over time. Um, talk about some of our current security challenges, um, the types of conflicts that we're seeing in Africa where and where we're seeing uh, the conflict. I also want to try to look ahead. Uh, that's hard to do, but um, I think we see some trends that are uh, worth considering, uh, some changing demographics, uh, changing economic and sociological factors that have implications for security uh, in the coming years. So we'll, uh, so I'll try to set that up and uh, kind of hopefully that leads into um, the remaining topics that we'll look at today, um, which is civil war, um, countering violent extremism, and looking at uh, riots and protests. And we've picked um, specific, specific case studies uh, for that. So where to start? Um, I like to think of conflict in maybe three waves, possibly four, when we're thinking about not just Africa, but just kind of a longer stretch, um, although not too long. So maybe looking from, say, World War II to the end of the Cold War, and there's a, there's a big break, not just in Africa, but kind of globally. And then the Cold War to about 2002, um, and that's more of a, a global break than it is on Africa, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, and then from, there's a much shorter period, 2002 to about 2010, and then 2010 on. And what does that really all mean, for, you know, for Africa? Let's see. Okay. So this is conflict trends from um, the period that I just described, 1946 to 2017. And um, a couple things to note. One is that there's lots of highs and lows, although there is kind of a, 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 a pattern that I'll, I will um, point, out, point out to you. Oh, when we see a few countries begin to adopt um, democracy. And, and it was thought that that would actually lead to a decrease in conflict, but what we actually saw uh, or see is that um, there was a rise in conflict. And that period coincides with kind of a global period of um, increased ethnic conflict. And we see, we certainly see that um, on the African uh, continent as well. There are a number of conflict systems that happened during that time. So in the early 90s, you had a lot of conflict in West Africa, um, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and then that spilled over into Guinea-Bissau. And then um, Cote d'Ivoire a few years later. Um, and then, of course, there's um, conflict in Central Africa that um, is normally, not normally, but many scholars will call it Africa's first world war just because of the number of, com of countries that were involved in the Congo. Um, at least nine, but I've seen analyses that um, go even beyond Central Africa and, and will include up to 11 different countries. And so that's, you know, context, contest for um, resources, influence, um, lots of different factors. And then we see a period of um, decrease. So if you look at right after um, 2000, there's a very steep decrease. And if you, you know, look, um, look to history, you see that there's been a number of peace agreements, peace agreements settled in um, Southern Africa, Angola, um, Liberia, certainly Central Africa, West Africa as well. And it was thought that that trend would continue, and it certainly did. But then around 2010, um, it, you know, we begin to see it increase as well. And today, we've seen um, conflict levels that are even higher than they were in the 1990s. And there's um, um, lots of different types of conflict. Uh, globally, many will point to that that conflict as being associated with religious extremism. We certainly see that on the continent, but that's not all that all the 
type of conflict that the only type of conflict that 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 we see today. Um, we see certainly, uh, of course, you know, Al Shabaab in the Horn of Africa, Boko Haram um, in northern Nigeria, and then um, AQIM and affiliates uh, in the broader Sahel, but. Um, there are communal conflicts that have, you know, no um, sort of religious, you know, underpinnings. Um, there's the conflict in um, South Sudan that is a more traditional kind of um, civil uh, civil conflict. So um, today, what we see in Africa is an uptick in conflict, and the question is, well, why is that happening? Um, as I said in the um, Earlier this morning, you know, there's never one reason why there's um, there's conflict. There's certainly a myriad of, of reasons. Um, one trend that we see is governance and governance issues that um, underlie whether or not a conflict um, breaks out after it's been settled. We see we're seeing a lot of that as well. Um, so certainly, uh, when you look at um, governance trends, you see a stagnation. Um, Democratic trends have also um, stagnated or sometimes even um, uh, gone backwards. So all of this might be reasons why we are seeing, you know, an uptick um, in conflict. We can also think of conflict um, from a geographic perspective. So is it all of Africa? You know, which countries are, are you know, generating um, the most conflict and what types of conflicts are we seeing? And for that, I look at a data set called um, the Armed Conflict Location Events Data. I'm not sure if anyone has has heard of it. Um, and the unique thing with um, ACLED, as it as the acronym is, um, and it's not the only one, but certainly the most known, is that the um, conflict has a geolocation, and so they actually have coordinates, and so that allows us to understand where the conflict is. And so what I've done is I've looked at just um, conflict for the last year, 2017, and picked out the um, top 10 uh, countries where we're seeing conflict today. So. At the um, top of the list is um, Somalia, and that takes up uh, almost 18 percent. Yeah, 18 percent. Um, Nigeria, South Sudan, the Democratic Repub Republic of Congo, South Africa, Libya, Burundi, Sudan, Kenya, and Tunisia. And altogether, these 10 countries make up about 70% of different types of conflict. Um, the top five countries, which are um, South Africa, the DRC, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia, make up about 46, almost half. And so um, we see that there are um, a handful of countries that are responsible for a great deal of conflict and a few more that are responsible for the majority of conflict. The other, um, inf the other piece of information we get from the data set is the different types of conflict. And um, ACLED has seven very um, distinct types of um, categories. But I've just picked the top three because um, as you can see, they are um, responsible for almost 80% um, of the conflict, and that is riots and protests, which are at the top of the of the of the list. Uh, violence against civilians, and something they call battle battles between armed groups, so government versus non-state, um, non-state actors versus non-state actors, and. If you actually look um, maybe 15 years ago or about 2000, you'll see that riots and protests are number three, but they've steadily moved up. And so an important question is, um, what is driving the riots and protests? Uh, I don't have a clear answer on that. I have some ideas. I alluded to governance stagnation and backsliding. Um, on democratic gains, and we certainly see that um, 
in the data. We see that corruption hasn't changed or the perception of corruption hasn't changed that much as well. And so maybe that's um, kind of tapping into grievance or frustration. Um, but that's certainly become the dominant way of expressing um, uh, your voice uh, on the on the continent. Um, violence against civilians. We know that conflict has has really put civilians in the their crosshairs for um, many years now, and that certainly shows up here. Um, and then you know, violence, uh, conflict, armed conflict continues um, on the continent, as you saw with the with the previous slide. So none of this is a is a um, is is really a, a surprise. But we also see that in these 10 countries, um, each of these countries has many different um, types of conflict that are uh, going on. So, you know, violent extremism in Somalia, Libya, Tunisia, parts of Kenya, um, and parts of Nigeria. Uh, Libya and Tunisia, we also see some fallout from the Arab Spring. And we'll hear more about um, CVE and Al-Shabaab uh, later this today. We have uh, contested governance, government, um, and ele electoral violence. Uh, South Sudan, the DRC, Burundi, um, South Sudan, um, the civil war started about two years after it gained in independence. So it gained independence in 2011. By the end of 2013, civil war had um, erupted. And we'll hear about that next uh, from my colleague, um, uh, Luca. The DRC, uh, there's, there's the conflict in the east. But as you'll see from your case study, there are um, worries about the election. Um, there are. Um, uh, concerns about um, um, conflict in other parts of the uh, of the country. Uh, we'll talk about Burundi uh, on Friday, but there's political violence that was generated by the government governments or the president's insistence on going for uh, what many thought was a third term, but he argued um, differently. But that resulted in um, a very protracted um, set of protests and. Um, uh, violent pushback from the government. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, we'll see Sudan, um, continued conflict in Darfur and um, other um, parts of the, of the continent, of the country. And then Nigeria has a number of different conflicts. Uh, Boko Haram is certainly what we all hear about, but there, there are um, many thousands that, that die in communal conflicts, um, contests, or, uh, competition um, between, you know, agricultural farmers and herders. And of course, in the Niger Delta. Uh, so there's there are many things going on, um, going on there. South Africa shows up. Um, and, and, and that's might be a surprise. But one of the things that that um, comes out with South Africa is the level of personal security, or personal insecurity, rather, and that shows up. Um, in the data, and that's that's why that um, uh, South Africa is uh, among the top ten um, countries where uh, we see uh, conflict incidents. So, a couple takeaways: one is that really a handful of countries generate a great deal of conflict, but um, that conflict is varied, even you know within the same country, as we see with Nigeria, as we see with Kenya. So I think that's important in um, understanding, you know, how to respond to conflict, um, who the stakeholders are. Stakeholders might be different depending on the different types of um, of, uh, of conflicts uh, that uh, that we see. What about the future? Well, there are uh, many different trends that we focus on, but I want to, to emphasize three different ones. One is uh, demographics and the demographic shifts. And I think they're gonna be uh, fairly dramatic uh, for Africa. Africa is now, uh, now has about just under, um, just about a billion people 
And in uh, 2050, that is poised to double to about um, 2 billion. So what does that mean? It's not just that there will be a lot of people, but we need to think about what does that mean for um, employment. Uh, right, Africa is already a very youthful continent. It will be more so um, in, in a few decades. Uh, what type of economic growth is needed to support um, that level of population growth? Africa is becoming increasingly urban. Uh, even today, a number of Africa's country, uh, cities are among the, the, um, the mega cities uh, globally. What does that mean in terms of governance? Uh, we, we've seen um, that riots and protests are at the top. Is that going to increase? How does government manage that? Um, sanitation, health care. Um, the DRC uh, recently has had a, a couple of uh, Ebola outbreaks in fairly urban areas, and that's been very scary because of um, how quickly um, such a communicable, communicable disease can spread in such a concentrated area. What might that mean for something, you know, for a city that's much bigger than some of the cities we've seen in, in the DRC? So that's, um, so all of that's important to think about um, in terms of how that might implicate um, uh, security are the demographic shifts that, that we see. Economic growth. For many years now, the continent has grown at a uh, pace that's faster than the rest of the world, but we haven't actually seen that trickle down. So it's been, some, some might term it growth without uh, development. So um, does that lead to uh, increased um, grievances at the, um, you know, among citizens? Um, what does that mean for uh, governance? Governance has been stagnating for the last um, decade or so. If you've got economic growth, it doesn't seem to be um, trickling down. What does that, what's that going to mean in terms of uh, security? The other thing we, we um, are discovering is that the level of economic growth that needs to keep up with the demographic changes might not be enough. And uh, just because the demographic changes are going to be so rapid and so dramatic, um, we're not going to be seeing um, the growth that's, that, can, um, that can absorb that. So this, is, this just looks at um, GDP growth from 2009 and also um, GDP per capita uh, growth from 2009. And we see that, let's see, I don't think this has a pointer, but we see that it's been, it's been increasing. So there was a downturn around 2008, which was the you know, global financial crisis, but it's been increasing. But it's not going to be enough, even as rapidly as Africa is growing, to um, meet the demands that are going to be um, uh, imposed by the demographics shift. So that's going to impact um, security. Another thing to think about is climate change. And uh, there's a lot of conflict, as I mentioned be before, um, conflict that we term communal conflict between herders and farmers. Uh, so one dramatic change is the, you may have seen this already, but it's the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, so Lake Chad was um, in uh, 1973, was covering that whole, that first uh, slide right there. Lake Chad is, is between um, Niger and, um, and Nigeria. In, in Chad, and um, today, uh, sorry, those dates are wrong, but today um, the Lake, Lake Chad has lost about 90% of its water. And in that particular region, because of um, Boko Haram, but other conflicts as well, you have about 9 million people that are facing a humanitarian um, crisis, emergency, about two and a half million that have um, been forced uh, from their homes, so they're displaced. Um, and then you've got the traditional movement of um, herders and the, um, the, um, the competition they have with farmers for water. So that's something that's being experienced right now. 
in Kenya, uh, you have um, had something similar. Um, well, you have something similar in many different regions. One region that um, I'll just use an example is a is a um, county called the Tana River County, and that's on the um, the the coast. It is um, the Tana River is Kenya's longest river, and um, but there's always been a lot of competition for land because only about nine percent of that land is arable. In the past, the farmers and the herders had a um, a system where, you know, during the dry periods, the herders um, would allow their or would the farmers would allow the herders to come in and graze and, and water their their cattle. Um, but that has broken down, um, and it, it especially came to a head in 2013. You had political actors that kind of. Um, um, took advantage of those of those grievances. Um, you had development that pitted the farmers against the herders. The farmers thinking that, or the herders, um, herds thinking that the government had favored the farmers, and um, the um, competition was so politicized that um, about 400 people um, died in um, pre-election violence in that county. Um, in 2013. And so, you know, you you have political actors that can manipulate some of these existing uh, grievances, but it's also um, generated by the fact that water and land um, are scarce in a, in a region. And that is projected to um, accelerate as they, you know, experts anticipate a... Um, uh, very uncertain um, rainy harvest season um, and um, higher food prices that come along with that, uh, lower consumption of food, uh, lower uh, sort of intake of nutrition, so a whole host of um, contributing factors to conflict. I just wanted to highlight those, um, those three in terms of looking ahead. Uh, that's all I have for you, and I'm happy to... Uh, open it up for, for discussion.